Okay, we'll go ahead and get started. Hello, everyone. I am Matt Bach, Assistant Director of Strategic Communications with the Michigan Municipal League. And this is Live with the League, our uh, regular conversation that we have with our Lansing legislative team and guests, uh, occasional guests. And uh, so thank you, uh, John Harrisada and uh, Jen is gonna be joining us shortly. Uh, Chris Hackbarth is on the road speaking today, so uh, we'll be without Chris today. But uh, we do have a special guest with us, um, Christy Welty from the Michigan Municipal League. She's in our events department. Welcome, Christy. Uh, Christy is here today to talk about our convention coming up. Um, our convention is going to be September 22nd through 24th in Grand Rapids in person during Art Prize. So it's a pretty exciting uh, convention. And I do ask uh, that if you have any questions for Christy or for any of our Lansing team, feel free to post them in the Q&A uh, portion of this and we'll answer the, as many of the questions as we can. And if we don't know the answers, we'll get back to you with someone who does. So thank you again for joining us. Uh, Christy, welcome to the show. Thanks, Matt. Happy to be here. Great. So I know you've been working very hard on the convention. A whole team of us have been working very hard on the convention. Tell us a little bit about what, what people should expect uh, for our first convention back in, in person in two years. It just, it's amazing that the time has gone by. So our last one in live in person was, uh, um, it would have been uh, two, 2019 in Detroit, I believe. Yes, yeah, I think that's the last time that our whole membership has been together. So it's it's very exciting. Convention in general is exciting, but now to, to really know that we're gonna be back in person together again, um, I think there's, there's a lot of anticipation and excitement and, and buzz around it. So right. um, we've got, we're packing a ton in to this year's convention. We've got four general sessions. We have five mobile tours that will get you out into Grand Rapids. We have 13 breakout sessions. And then um, we also have our CEA presentations and the award that we'll give out on Friday and um, some special guest performances and other little attendee experiences sprinkled in. So a lot, a lot to look forward to. Yeah, it's really nice. I would like how you mentioned the CEAs of Community Community Excellence Awards. Those, that really kind of bookends our, our convention, doesn't it? It starts off that first day as the presentations of the four finalists, and then people get to vote. And then they're, at the end, we kind of do the crime. Talk us a little bit about that and the CEA portion of it and how that works. Yeah, absolutely. So on um, Wednesday, after our opening general session, our communities who have been um, selected as finalists for the CEAs will give um, seven minute presentations to talk about the projects that their communities um, have done. And then there will be a booth set up right near our registration area at the Amway Grand. And um, you'll be able to stop by and vote um, throughout the rest of Wednesday and then Thursday. And uh, Friday, we will, based on your voting, we will pick our, our top finalist as our winner and it's gonna be great great yeah it's pretty exciting and we have four finalists i would try to name all the cities but i only can think of three at the moment so i don't want to miss someone out. i'll go back get back to that so tell us a little bit about um the convention we kind of um because it you know is it, you know is the pandemic has been focused on of course for many of us in the past you know almost two years now or a year and a half and uh, our convention is kind of picking up on that vibe a little bit. Tell us a little bit about the convention uh, theme and some of the focuses and some of the takeaways people will have uh, attending. Yeah, so our, our theme this year is trust and belonging, a community revival. Um, and we're really focused on ensuring our attendees leave with some, some core feelings of um, being optimistic, empowered, courageous, and, and open-minded. And are we, struggled with a lot the past you know yeah. year and a half two years and and we've thrived as as our communities and you can see it with our CEAs and our, our speakers and, and everything that we've done so we really want to showcase that um, and it's not just about the successes but we're also talking about the failures too um, I think we've we know that there's a lot to recognize so um, in everything we're doing for convention this year yeah I think it's important and uh uh, you know, I think our convention or our, our league president, uh, Bill Wild, will talk about this in the opening general session, just about, you know, it's important, you mentioned the failures, it's important to, you know, try new things and be open-minded and, and to learn from, because you're going to, when you be open-minded, you, you often try things you haven't done before, and sometimes they're a hit, hit a success, and sometimes they're not. So I think, you know, we're trying to encourage our members to, 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 to take risks and, and learn from your failures because knowing that you're going to have some failures and that's okay and just learn from them and, and move on. Is that right? Absolutely. 
Yeah, and, and you can get so much out of your failures too, right? And you can teach other communities and, and grow. And it's just, it's going to be very collaborative uh, yeah. this year. So, yeah. So, um, talk a little bit about some of the other highlights. You mentioned some of the mobile tours. What are some of the things that people are going to see and hear about? Yeah, so we have five mobile tours. Um, we will do a tour of Art Prize, and we're also um, incorporating WEMCAT, which is uh, the, the Arts and Technology Center in Grand Rapids. So a little bit different from if you were in 2018's convention, their Art Prize tour, we're, we're expanding that and, and doing some cool things there. Um, we do have a 2030 district tour. Um, we have um, the Evolution of Grand Rapids, which will have Mark Miller from Grand Rapids, Inc., but we'll also have Mark Washington, who is on our board of trustees and the city manager of Grand Rapids. So he'll tag along in that tour and, and give some insight, which is going to be really cool. Um, we're doing a walk in the park um, at Clemente Park with the um, Friends of Grand Rapids Parks and Rec. Um, they're going to show how important parks and recreation have been throughout the pandemic um, and what they've done to really uplift the community throughout that. And then um, we're also doing a tour on innovation solutions for attainable housing um, and some of the attainable housing districts and modular housing um, throughout Grand Rapids. So lots packed into these five tours. Um, just as, as a shout out to anyone who did um, register for the Evolution of Grand Rapids tour on Friday. We have switched it to Thursday and we sent out an email last week. Um, we've done this just so Mark Washington will be able to join us and be part of that tour. So uh, we're excited about, about having him. Yeah, and so what, what should people know about the tours? Are they all walking tours? So do they have comfortable shoes or, or, or some of them are, are going to be bus mostly or how, how will that work? Yeah, so we'll have shuttle buses to take you to um, different points. Um, a lot of them will have majority on the shuttle bus just so we can get to all the different locations but we will have stops along the way so be sure you wear comfortable shoes especially if you attend the park tour uh, you will be able to walk around Clemente Park and see all, all the things that they've done there um, so be comfortable and bottle of water and ready to go. Yeah I think it's important to say that we, we try to be descriptive of what they should expect and we'll put walking tour in there and I know in years past, we've had people show up, you know, in, in shoes that aren't very conducive for a lot of walking because they're like, oh, it's, I'm like, well, it says right in there in the title walking tour. So it's always good to have as many reminders as we can that let people know. Yeah, absolutely. Um, but not to, to shift the conversation to, you know, the what everyone is thinking about, but on our mobile tours, you are going to be required to wear a mask. Um, just on the shuttle, they, we are using public transportation, which is still requiring masks. So um, if you don't have one, we'll have one for you on the bus. Um, but just so you are aware and there's no surprises there. Yeah, and that's a good point. I mean, obviously we know about the, the COVID numbers are, are going back up again, going in the wrong direction with some of the variants that are happening with, with the coronavirus. Uh, what are some of the, the precautions and things that we're putting in place for convention to, to try to make people feel as, as comfortable and, and as safe as they can? Yeah, absolutely. So as excited as we are to be back in person, we do know that that has some other challenges surrounding it. So. Um, out of the, the safety for, for everyone, um, the league staff will be wearing masks throughout the entire event. Um, at this point, we are not requiring that our attendees wear masks aside from on these mobile tours, um, but we do encourage it based on recommendations. Um, we are working with the Amway Grand to make sure that their cleaning process is you know, stellar and that they're doing a lot of things there um, with hand sanitizing stations and um, making sure that spacing is correct between attendees sitting in their space. Um, I think one of the most unique things that we're doing as well is something called the Respect the Red campaign. So respect our registration, the Respect the Red. Okay. So um, we will have red wristbands and stickers at the registration desk. So if you aren't quite comfortable holding hands or shaking hands or, or fist bumping or, or being really close to people at this point, um, Grab a red wristband, have that on, and we'll know that we can still engage with you and, and have all of these great conversations, but we'll just stand a little bit further back until you give us the okay that we can, you know, feel a little bit closer in your bubble. And I think it'll be a really easy way without making it awkward of it's too close. Yeah. Right. So, um, so just grab a wristband if you if you need one and that'll help. Well, that's a really good idea. I'm glad I'm glad that we're doing that. I think that'll help a lot of people, put some people at ease. Um, talking about some of the sessions, uh, we had, like you mentioned, all the different um, general sessions and breakouts that we're having. What are some of the, the highlight sections, sessions you think that uh, people are going to be most uh, uh, interested in or what are some of the things you're looking forward to as well? 
Yeah. Um, oh, geez, there's so much. There's so much <laughs> packed in into our, our three short days. Um, we will have some of the SSAD team presenting on um, our opening general session on Thursday morning. They're going to be joined um, with Jana um, Graham as well from our uh, labs team. So they're going to talk about some of the Serve My City things and funding. So that's going to be really, really great. Um, we will have a panel of bridge builders for our Thursday afternoon opening general session. So that will be awesome. And um, bridge yeah. builders, explain what that is. <laughs> yeah, so they were micro grant winners um, from the uh, League Foundation. So um, we have a couple different levels of neighborhood grants um, and Main Street grants. So there's there's a lot of information there that I could do a whole live week talking about that. So <laughs> check out the foundation page for, for some information on, on those winners. Um, but they will be at convention as well to, to hear their stories and, and what they're doing in their communities to literally build build bridges between people um, right. and, and to really have have that trust and belonging. It all ties together. It's so great. Yeah. Yeah, for sure. We we talk a lot about you know community wealth building, which is which is our evolution of placemaking. It's really placemaking through an equity lens to make sure that everyone is somehow included in the thoughts and, and the deliberative processes that take place at our communities. Um, so we have a lot of stuff focusing on that. Trust and belonging are key components of community wealth building. So we have people speaking about um, you know, ways that they're building trust and belonging in their communities. And we have a couple of sessions on that. So I'm looking forward to you know, all those sessions, but you know, particularly the stuff that I think is hopefully we'll have our members walking away with like, hmm, I didn't really think of that before. I'm, I'm glad I attended because this is an idea I can take back with my community. Because many times, even though if it's a really large community, like the, maybe a, you know, a Bridgman feels like they can't relate to what the city of Grand Rapids is doing because they're, they're a lot smaller, but there's pieces that you could take, take away from, even though the size of the community is, is vastly different. I think there's parts and lessons learned that you can uh, bring back to your own communities. Absolutely. I think that's a great point is that it's not just for, for large communities. It's We really are, are highlighting all across Michigan and showing that it doesn't take you know, a ton to make a difference. Yeah, and these bridge builders grants that we talked about uh, the the micro grants for the for the, for the uh, neighborhoods were only five hundred dollars. So even with five hundred dollars, you could really make an impact. You know, we've we've had some great success with that program, and then we have the neighborhood grants uh, for the bridge builders, which were five thousand dollar grants, a little bit bigger. Um, but we have people from those recipients. Uh, from those grants are going to be performing, and some are going to be speaking. So we'll have different things happening. Yes. So that's exciting. All right, well, good. Well, thank you for that. I did have one question from you, or I guess we answered it. Uh, oh, it was somebody, maybe it answered online, but it was, it's probably, um, oh, it's had to do with the EOA credits. And it looks like we answered that question. But for anyone that maybe didn't see the question, the question was, can we get credit for all the webinars we have attended toward our event credits? And the answer is yes, you will receive one uh, EOA credit for each of the webinars you have attended we are working on getting those credits in the system soon. So um, I don't know if you have anything you wanted to add on that, Christy, about the EOA, the Elected Officials Academy credits. No, you will get credit again for attending convention as you have in the past. And yeah, that's not much more to add. <laughs> okay, all right, good. All right, well, thank you, Christy, for joining us. And uh, she's uh, our events guru. So I appreciate your time and all the energy. We're, we're really looking forward to convention. We're really looking forward to seeing everybody and their faces in person. And do fist bumps where it's allowed and then that kind of thing. So, yeah, awesome. Well, thanks for having me, Matt. And we'll see you in Grand Rapids. All right. Thank you. You're welcome. Okay. Well, uh, I'm going to bring on our events team now. We have with us uh, Harrisana, John, and Jennifer Richterink. Um, and uh, thank you for joining us today, guys. So it's been kind of a quiet time and, and a little bit quiet time for some of us anyways, because uh, the legislature hasn't been in session, although they were in, I think, at least a day last week. So tell us a little bit about uh, what has been happening in Lansing, and uh, then we'll maybe shift over to D.C. So go ahead, John, and, and kind of start where we're at with the schedule and, and the, the sessions. Sure. Yeah. How are you, Matt? Uh, nice to see you, Jen and Harrisana. Um, you know, so Lansing has been uh, slow if you think about the number of times they've been in session, uh, but slow does not actually describe what, what's taking place there right now uh, for a lot of reasons. Uh, the session was in last week, uh, very little activity from the standpoint of, of moving bills as they relate to the budget or the American Rescue Plan. 
Uh, but behind the scenes, there's been a lot of conversation that is taking place on that, both which we have been involved in very directly uh, and, and trying to influence, um, but also trying to figure out what the next steps are. As we've talked about many times on this program, uh, relationships are everything in this world, and the relationship between the administration and the legislature is about exactly where it's been for the last year and a half, uh, which is, you know, on edge at best. Um, and so they're still trying to navigate their way through what they're going to do next with the budget. Uh, the difference being from when we first started having this conversation months and months and months ago is the fact that the deadline is now looming. Uh, we are, are just over a month away uh, from the, the state fiscal year being completed. So that ends on September 30th. And, and by the Constitution, they have to have a balanced budget in place come October 1. And so we are, are getting to be crunch time in this conversation. And then you add uh, $6.4 in American Rescue Plan funds. Uh, to that uh, adds another layer. And then you add about another three and a half billion in excess GF and it adds another layer to that. And oh yeah, by the way, on Friday, the budget director announced that he was going to leave at the end of September. So that's that's budget director Dave Masseron, who's formerly with the city of Detroit, has, has accepted a position with Wayne State University. Uh, um, and I can tell you uh, from the time that announcement was made on Friday until now, I don't necessarily have a lot more answers in terms of exactly what's going to happen, but what I can tell you is it will definitely change the dynamic, potentially the pace uh, at which this uh, comes into play, and whether or not ARP will or won't be a bigger part of the discussion could also play into this. A lot of the reason for that, Matt, is, as I had mentioned before, is relationships. So Budget Director Masseron has been working with the legislature very directly, uh, most involved with those conversations compared to anybody else. And as a result, prior to his departure, I'm sure they'll try to get as much done as they possibly can. So that puts us on high alert as a staff um, for a lot of reasons. Uh, but I can tell you, I've already been on the phone twice this morning talking about it very directly. And we have a meeting uh, internally this afternoon to kind of reassess where we sit uh, and what we need to do in the coming week. So rather than enjoying that last week before uh, Labor Day uh, and being able to get our kids off to school, in a nice fashion, we're going to sit back, reevaluate, and figure out how we engage in this process probably a little bit more directly right now. And when does the legislature come back, like officially official, I guess if that's the right wording, uh, to really get a lot of this work done? Yeah, I just saw a revised schedule this morning, and I haven't memorized it yet. But really what they're going to do is they will come back in earnest from a meeting standpoint just after Labor Day. Okay. Uh, there is obviously uh, one other holiday that's involved in there, and then the, uh, the the Detroit Chamber of Commerce has their annual Mackinac Policy Conference uh, that runs at the same exact time our our convention is running, oh, and so they will have a limited schedule that week as well. But other than that, we anticipate you know a full three day a week schedule throughout the month of September. Um, you know, lots of discussion as I had mentioned on the budget and, and ARP spending. Uh, with the need, and not just the hopes, but with the need to wrap up uh, at least the, the budget, even if it becomes a baseline budget by the end of, of September. Okay, you mentioned the ARP funding, the American Rescue Plan Act funding. We did get a question by, uh, from a uh, person attending today asking if we we're going to talk about that. Uh, if you have any specific questions for us about the American Rescue Plan um, Act dollars, so we're happy to get into that as best we can. Uh, so we will ask any questions, but um, you know, right now I know that things are going for, for some of the communities that the checks have already been sent for the larger cities and for the other ones that uh, for most of our members have already declared their intentions for how they plan to accept the, the ARP money. So I know that's kind of uh, now they're just probably waiting for the checks to come in the mail. So I don't know if there's much more to say on that, but uh, John, go ahead. Yeah, the only thing I'd add to that, I don't have a specific date for when the check is 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 going to to hit the bank account. We know that 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 process is going to be wrapping up in a couple of weeks, and we anticipate the checks, you know, delivered very very shortly uh, thereafter. Um, but Treasury is in the process of working within their deadline to make sure that they get all communities to respond. And the reason that that's important is because once they know if all communities have responded, then that will determine if there's any excess dollars that need to be reappropriated. And so I know where we sit right now is we have nearly every 
every single city and village uh, that has responded to Treasury. If you have not responded, I'm sure, you know, if you if you look on our, our web page, it, <laughs> you've heard from us. I mean, our staff has been following up. Treasury has been following up. I know every single city has responded. We have a handful of villages uh, left to respond. And, and fortunately for us, we've had very, very few that have actually elected uh, not to, to accept those funds uh, for, for a variety of reasons. But in general, we are making great progress on that. I would anticipate that in the, in the coming weeks, we'll know more about an exact timeline. But this is not something that's going to linger for months and months and months. I can, I can promise you that uh, based on the way in which you know, the guidelines uh, from the federal government are out there. And so this is a, a days and weeks issue, not a month's issue. Okay. Well, very good. Um, so let's bring in uh, Jen and Harisana now. If, uh, if you guys could talk, we'll start with you, Jen. I know we've talked a lot about the, the short-term rental issue in the past, but you have other things that uh, you have going as well. What are some of the things as we get into the fall that you're really going to be focused on uh, heading into convention and, and beyond? Yeah, so the short-term rental issue is still um, ongoing and will definitely be a priority as we head here into fall, as well as the preemption on um, sand and gravel mining. So we'll be watching those um, aggregate bills that are uh, in the House now and House local government and anticipate those to have a hearing and, and some, some movement or at least um, some uh, committee hearings on those. So we'll be looking to folks to weigh in. Um, I mean, there is a multiple uh, things going on, but those are really the two biggest. Uh, we are also uh, closely watching and, and working with some of our members who are dealing with marijuana petitions in their communities. Um, and so that's something, uh, there's a session about that actually at convention um, that I think uh, a lot of our members will be interested in, even if um, their community is not facing one of these petitions currently. Um, and so that's something um, that we also there's a lot of talk of marijuana reform and, and things like that that we're following closely. So talk to me, what, what does that mean, marijuana petitions? Is this something lo local petitions to try to get on the local ballot, like either to allow it or not allow it? Is that what it is? Yeah, so um, this really affects home rule cities and villages. When um, adult use was passed, there is a process within the law for uh, a referendum process. Um, but it, we have a group that's going around the state to our home rule um, members and um, using that um, referendum process that's in adult use, but doing it for the medical marijuana um, and trying to uh, do charter amendments. Um, which is not something we've seen in the past. Um, usually, you know, you're trying to change a zoning ordinance or um, get a zoning ordinance to allow or not allow. So um, it is unique. Again, it affects home rural cities and villages. Um, if you're a community that is facing one of these um, and you haven't been in contact with us, um, please reach out. Uh, we have a group. Um, the municipal attorneys has an actual group that's working on this as well, um, and we can and we can help go from there. And like you said, we have a session at our convention, a breakout session on this very issue because it's it's been it's becoming more and more prevalent. So um, we definitely have something we're aware of. Uh, another question, John, is somewhat related. I think it's for you. It says, why are the ARP census numbers higher than SEMCAI? I guess both groups had numbers out. I'm not sure exactly what that question is. Do you understand that? Yeah, I you know I I. I don't know the exact answer to that. And just a, a little bit of a guess here for a second is one, the 2020 census numbers were just released. And so if there is a comparison of those census numbers to the comparison of the ARP numbers that were utilized because of when ARP passed and when the census was, was completed and that data set was deemed to be accurate, um, the ARP used 2019 estimates as a way in which to determine their individual uh, allocation for, for communities versus uh, the 2020 numbers, which had not been put out at that point. So if you look at those two, there would definitely be a discrepancy between 2019 and 2020, one being estimates, one being the actual 2020. Okay, and they should go by the the actual number, the number that they were notified that they. No, were. so for for AR for ARP purposes, yes. they use the 2019 estimates. Okay. Period. Right. No, no adjustment will be made for the second tranche either. Uh, it will still utilize 2019 numbers versus 2020. Okay. 
Okay, good. Uh, so Harrisana, uh, nice to see you. <laughs> People don't realize we haven't seen each other for for a long time either. So in, in person for sure. So we're looking forward to convention uh, on doing that. Uh, what are some of the kind of the things you're you're working on heading into the fall in the convention and, and beyond? Yeah, well, it's good to see you as well, Matt, and everyone else. I mean, for sure, the conversation around high waters and coastal erosion, we still have that 40 million supplemental uh, proposal still out there. And I'm sure as budget conversations continue into the fall and the urgency around that with Director Mastron's departure, that's definitely going to be a high item for us as well. Um, elections are going to come back. We've seen lots of legislation that was introduced in the House, uh, some bills that were mirroring the bills that we've seen in the Senate earlier this spring. So there'll be definitely some engagement on that. And I'm sure there's going to be some priority bills that certain caucuses are going to want to push through ahead of the election uh, in 2022. So we're definitely going to be engaged there. And then COVID-19. I mean, we're watching the Delta variant increase. There's going to be lots of conversations about what that means for public safety, what that means for processes and priorities where it comes to employment and public spaces. Uh, last week, we had a hearing uh, where we saw Rep Representative Aller's bill on vaccines, where that included that an employer would not be able to require their employee to take not only the COVID-19 vaccine, but Tdap vaccines, the flu vaccines. Um, we saw some strong opposition from the business community in that area as well, too. Uh, and that's going to be a big dialogue that's going to con continue as we talk about their doses, as we talk about managing different populations of those who are vaccinated, unvaccinated, and of course, those who are unable to do so. So we'll, we're going to see a lot of themes that we saw earlier in the spring come back. Um, and then another one on the infrastructure side, we know we will be seeing a couple bills on dam safety. Remember last year, the Midland floods, floods happened, and we've done a lot of research on the state side on what caused that dam failure, responsible parties, and also identifying ways that we can address and remediate those structures in the future. So we'll be seeing a package come through um, on the Senate side, and I'm sure that'll be of a lot of interest to our members as well. Okay. Now, I know, uh, thank you, Harrison, I appreciate that. <laughs> Uh, one of the issues, uh, Jen, you're working on quite a bit is the housing issue. And one of the issues that all of our communities, a lot of our communities are, fa are facing right now is having affordable housing or attainable housing for their, their citizens. Uh, and you're on, a, a, I think, on a commission, uh, a statewide commission that kind of work on this issue. What's the latest on, on that topic? Yeah, I mentioned all of the things we're playing defense on, but um, proactively, we are definitely working on housing. Um, yes, we um, the league is part of the executive committee for the Housing Michigan Coalition, um, as well as working um, with Michigan on the statewide housing um, strategy. The housing strategy is being put together and finalized right now. Um, so a lot of moving parts around housing. Um, there's a package of bills uh, that have passed out of the Senate. There are twin bills over in the House that we expect to go over to the Senate. Um, here in the fall when they start back up, but that is definitely a proactive, important issue that we're involved in, um, and we'll see some more work on that going um, here this fall and into the next year. Okay, well, good. All right, well, thank you. Um, did want to uh, just kind of promote a couple other events coming up. Of course, our convention is September 22nd through the 24th. Uh, feel free to register. We're still taking registrations. Uh, we have a great lineup uh, plan, so I hope that you uh, do that. Um, and then we have uh, an event later this week, uh, Wednesday at noon, August 25th. It's what's happening inside MDOT's local agency program. Uh, John, can you talk a little bit about that, what, that session? Uh, this is a part of a series of, of sessions we've done with uh, MDOT. What can people come to expect uh, at Wednesday's event? <clears throat> Yeah, so happy happy to chat about that quick. Uh, you know, this is something that we've been doing with with MDOT. I, I don't want to say on and off, but strategically over the last couple of years, uh, simply because the local agency program uh, within the department is exceptionally connected to what you do on the ground every single day. And I always joke about this, but sometimes it, it's it's a, a stark difference between what we do because we do so many things as cities and villages versus what a road commission may do because all they do is, is roads. And so while our members have multiple tasks and, and multiple focuses, it was a way in which to connect both our managers, our DPW directors and others with, within the, the community to what goes on in the local agency program at MDOT. So they'll review everything from you know, new policies, federal bulletins, different notices at the state level. So 
you know, we try to post those on our blogs as much as possible, but sometimes they tend to communicate with members directly versus with some very specific things. So it's just a, a good way in which to, to make that connection, make sure those relationships are strong between our members and, and the department and the agency or, or the, the, the program within the, the overall department that they would connect with most uh, as a way to bring you information that you might not get on a day-to-day -day basis or may have missed just because of other things going on. So it's really helpful for us to just, just maintain that connection. Oh, awesome. Great. Yeah, it's always very helpful. We have a very similar uh, series of webinars going on with our treasury state treasury department too. Um, so that's something that came to keep an eye out for. Uh, the, I did want to, one other program note, our next live with the league would normally be on Monday, September 6th, but that is Labor Day. So we're moving our next live with the league to that Tuesday, September 7th. So please note that in your calendars, our next live with the league will be noon on Tuesday, September 7th. And we'll have a lot, the legislature will be kicking back up uh, with a lot of things to talk about then. So that's all I have from my notes. Uh, unless there's any questions on Facebook I didn't see, I th think we're all set. So uh, Matt, I'm gonna hop back in here because yep. there's one other thing I wanna sure. talk about. Um, and it may be in your notes if you read really carefully. <laughs> uh, I read it correctly. Oh, the which is, which is the federal infrastructure package, <laughs> which is you know only this $1.2 trillion uh, package that passed the the Senate at the federal level and now yeah. sits before the House. So, you know, no, 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 no big news there. Uh, the right, right. 1.2 trillion. Um, but it is a big deal. And, and so I, I, I will take a couple of uh, uh, seconds to talk about it. We did sure. put out uh, a statement on that, and then there's a very specific part. I'll ask Harrisana to, to weigh in on which we put a, another statement out in regards to the Storm Act that uh, Senator Peters was very directly involved in. But as you can imagine, in 1.2 trillion, there's a lot of different spending items in there. So a couple that are, are really key highlights for us is overall, there's 110 billion uh, in there for roads and bridges. Uh, and if we think about what Michigan's minimum share is, and the reason I say minimum share is because there's a, a formula, much like we have at the state level, that's going to dictate some direct dollars coming into the state. And then there are some grant-based programs where that number could, could exceed what the minimum amount would be. But in this case, it's $7.3 billion minimum for federal aid eligible roads coming into the state, which will be a mix of you know, uh, highways and M roads and, and local roads that are federal aid eligible and almost 600 million uh, for bridges, uh, which is gonna be substantial. And we also know that the state legislature is putting a focus on bridges as well. So as we think about a critical piece of infrastructure, there could potentially be a lot of help coming for that. Uh, there's $39 billion out there for transit. Uh, and as you know, we've been big fans and advocates for transit. Yeah. Uh, so that can make a substantial difference in how we think about moving people uh, in this state. Uh, there's $55 billion out there for water and sewer, lead service lines, uh, PFAS, um, and we think about Michigan's share in general could be at a minimum 1.3 billion of that in direct allocation, plus access to, to additional funds that could be both grant-based or loan-based. Uh, there's significant resources in there to address some climate change issues. There's 7.5 billion out there for EV charging stations, mm. which in a, a, a formula-based aspect, Michigan is entitled to at least 110 million of that, which doesn't sound like much. Uh, but when you think about the overall scope that they have access to, that number could rise to 2.5 billion of that $7.5 billion total. If you just think about the makeup and the nature of, of our state uh, and it's tied to the auto industry, it would make sense that, that we would be in a very good position uh, to, to get uh, a, a lion's share of those dollars. And, and we're hoping to do so. And quite frankly, from an organizational standpoint, we try to be at the forefront of some of those conversations, not just to be able to receive dollars, but to make sure that our communities are going to be in a position to deploy those resources in a way that makes sense, both from you know our, our, our placemaking models that we've talked about in terms of how we have these things in downtown areas, accessible to people, but also from the future aspect of this and how it ties to our community wealth building uh, efforts and, and really having equitable access to these uh, charging stations. Um, there's $42 billion in there for broadband. It seems to be the issue that they're throwing money at left and right. Uh, yeah. it's, a, it's a critical issue as we think about it, but again, making sure we think about this tr truly through an equity lens uh, right. and not just a rural versus urban lens uh, 
and recognizing that there are broadband issues in all portions in, in all of our communities and making sure that we deal with that. There's money in there for cybersecurity and brownfield cleanup. And as I had mentioned, uh, the Storm Act earlier, I have Harris on and talk about that a little bit, but there's $500 million uh, in the Storm Act um, or for the Storm Act. And, and so with that, I'll, I'll turn it back over to Harris. Wow, yeah. Yes. <laughs> So just to go back a little bit, um, first saying a huge thank you to Senator Peters, who has been a steadfast ally to us around coastal resiliency ever since he's joined the Senate. He has been very engaged with what our communities have been running up against related to funding, related to holistic infrastructure, and just starting a conversation on what it means for Michigan especially to be resilient uh, and intentional about the health of our shorelines. So last year, um, Senator Peters passed the STORM Act, uh, and that included the establishment of a new loan program through FEMA that would allow for proactive mitigation. So what a lot of our communities run up against right now is that High waters, coastal erosion is not a, you know, emergency event as defined by emergency statute. It's not, it's rather cyclical instead of a specific time, excuse me. So we're running into limited sources of funding that are only available when you have a circumstantial disaster and not really a shift in your climate. And this considerably limits how much funding is available to local municipalities to utilize for remediation efforts, uh, to address public safety hazards and utility issues that may come up shoreline erosion. And also start thinking about in the future, when we have high waters, low waters, and these events happening over and over again, how can our communities think about resiliency in the long term? So as John mentioned, the STORM Act uh, now has $500 million that have been dedicated to start this loan program over five years. Communities will be able to access these resources without having to be in a natural disaster and be much better resource to think proactively, think intentionally, think innovatively on the different things that they can do to amplify coastal resiliency. And so we're really appreciative of that. And I think the best thing that we can do for our member communities is diversify the resources that are available to them and hopefully make those resources stack and work in in concert with each other too, so we can really encourage our members to take the big lifts and doing these infrastructure projects that can have really big results. Right, yeah, and speaking of infrastructure and, and the roads and the bridges, we did get a question of, on uh, Facebook just now about that issue and I'll pose it real quick. Federal, just to clarify, the federal legislation that was passed reauthorized current levels of funding for roads and bridges and added 110 billion on top of that, is that correct, question mark? <laughs> Yeah, so it's a mix of reauthorization and new money uh, as, as we think about this. Um, but but the 110 is is in reference to new dollars as a result of the the, the 1.2. So, you know what we have to remember here, um, much like what we think about in our budget, there's a lot of moving parts. And so one, it's not signed by the president yet. I always want to make sure we're really clear uh, as to where we sit in this process. It has passed the Senate, uh, currently sits before the House. The Senate, uh, shortly after passing the infrastructure package, passed the framework of a $3.5 trillion uh, budget resolution at the, at the federal level. The reason for it being a, um, or sorry, budget reconciliation process at the federal level, the reason for it being in the reconciliation process is because they can do and, and pass that budget uh, with a simple majority, which is they sit 50-50 in the Senate, the vice president can break the tie. Right. Um, and there's a variety of new spending items in there as well. Um, we fully anticipate that the House will pass the infrastructure plan. The question really becomes timing and how that plays into the reconciliation process. Uh, so I don't want to count all of these dollars as guaranteed, but I think it's highly likely that we're going to see a significant amount of new resources, both in infrastructure and a variety of other sectors as we, we think about where the feds can deploy those, those resources. Um, but at the end of the day, uh, what we know and what we have advocated for, whether that be in ARP, whether that be uh, in dollars that will come in through the federal side or through the reconciliation process, is try to, one, make sure they're flexible, and two, as much as possible, can actually get into the hands of local communities uh, to make the most uh, substantial uh, difference that, that we can. And, and so far, we've, we've been successful. We'll continue to work with the National League of Cities on that aspect and, and thank all of our partners along the way, like Senator Peters and others. Yeah, for sure. So, um, EJ, was that the thing you wanted to add to about the, for the infrastructure that you said you had? Yeah, my, my side note to you is yes, that was the one closing <laughs> okay. comment I wanted <laughs> to make. Sure. I don't want to miss it. So, well, thank you so much. Um, 
I appreciate everybody's attending us today. Uh, we're looking forward to convention coming up. Uh, we will have one more live with the league before convention so we can uh, update our, our viewers on that. So thank you, Jen and uh, Harrison and John and Christy for being our guest today. And I hope to see everyone next time and hope to see everybody at convention next month. So thank you again. Have a good day.